Hey guys, welcome out to Revolution again. Um, I thought I'd continue on with examining the debate between James White and Peter Van Cleek. And so um, this is uh, Texas Receptus is equal to the New Testament autographs, James White versus Dr. Peter, um, or Dr. James White versus Dr. Peter Van Cleek. I know a few people have issues with James White saying that he's a doctor. Um, to me, it doesn't really matter either way. Um, you're either right or you're wrong, regardless of whether you have an alphabet soup after your name or you are just a um, normal farmer who has the truth. <laughs> um, I think a, a lot of um, a lot of the credentials nowadays, a lot of people just look at credentials and they don't they don't trust people who don't have credentials. I'm the opposite. Usually if they've got credentials. I, I tend to think, well, um, they there's a good chance they could have been poisoned <laughs> against um, good logic and common sense. But anyway, let's um, actually, before we start looking at the, the video, so roughly around um, the one hour, 30 minute mark is where we stopped last time. And so uh, this is part four. So um, it looks like there's going to be a few other parts as well. But um, I thought I'd just show you what's happening um, and also what's been happening and why I've been so busy. So, um, okay. So, oh, actually, I had a debate. I'll just open up YouTube. <clears throat> I had a debate um, with Michael Borowski. So this is this one here. And we had a debate on the reading of Revelation 16, 5 and 1 John 5, 7. So if you want to know my perspective on Revelation 16, 5 and also on 1 John 5, 7, I would encourage you to go through that debate. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know, for a quick roundabout, um, answer on Revelation 16.5. I've written a book on it. Sometimes it can be hard to um, explain to people about nominous sacra and things like that. And so, um, but yeah, I'd encourage you to go there. And so this was just two days ago. So that's why I've been quite busy and haven't completed um, these videos. And I'm also in the process of doing um, some videos with um, looking at uh, the Texas Receptus and also looking at a debate with Timothy Berg and Andrew Sluder. So we're in the process of that. And we're also in the process of looking at Desiderius Erasmus and um, his perspective on the Comiohenium. So we're going through that material as well. So there's quite a lot of um, sort of loose ends. And so I thought, well, I'll just go through and I'll do another one of these videos and we'll try and clear up this James White issue. And um, what's been interesting too is I'll just show you this. So this is a debate commentary, uh, White's opening statement part two. So this, someone's been posting these onto the Texas Receptors Academy um, on Facebook. So this is um, Peter Van Cleek Sr. and Peter Van Cleek Jr. So they're doing their own little commentary, which is really good. And I sort of thought that would be um, a good avenue for these guys because I know a lot of people watch my videos. And seriously, like sometimes people with a lot to say, they might write it all in a blog. But if people aren't, some, a lot of people don't read long-winded blogs. They, they listen to things. They're on the run. They're, they're driving somewhere and they want to, or they're on a train. They want to put something um, on their headphones and, and listen. And so, um, yeah, I was actually going to encourage uh, Peter or uh, what I was thinking of doing was getting him on my program to talk about this sort of stuff. But it looks it looks like they're doing their own thing anyway. So um, I think that's really good. Um, because, you know, he's obviously the most qualified to talk about his own debate. Um, so, yes, so what else is happening? Stephen Avery is getting interviewed by um, a guy called Follow In Truth LJ. So I'm pretty sure Follow In Truth LJ, um, 
he's he frequents um our um chat as well and so oftentimes i'll see his name come up and he'll ask you know very good questions and have some really good input and so um you know obviously stephen avery is prolific in his writing about the the communion um, and many other verses that have been contested by modern text critics so that will be very interesting so that's in seven hours i'll probably be asleep that's going to be at one o'clock in the morning here so i'll probably have to just listen to that tomorrow um so apart from that i want to go through and i've because um peter van cleek has been doing videos so i'll have to you know go through and, and listen to them and think about them because i I've, I've noticed they're up to like part four i think it is at the moment anyway um i want to read through what he has on his blog and so that was one of the things i guess in a way why a lot of people were jumping onto my videos was because i was reading all this stuff out so it saves you know um yeah, people just going through people people are lazy i'm lazy i go through and i i you know i see a long article and i think oh and i usually copy and paste it and put in into an audio player but if someone's going to read that out to me i usually i'll tune in um and so i think it's just the way of the future um you know opening a youtube account i, I would encourage everyone to do so who's a tr defender kjv defender um if you you know want to do something on my program uh let me know if you want to be interviewed or you've written a book and you you want that uh promoted or anything like that just just contact me um the first video that we did um about james white has had you know 433 views which is pretty good for eight days um it's not the sort of um audience that you would get you know on um, myth vision or something like that or a bart ehrman blog or even james white you know, he usually gets between 15 and twenty thousand um viewers every time he does a dividing line that's still a lot of people interested you know roughly between two and four hundred two and five hundred um each time we do a, a video so that's that's pretty cool all right so um i'm going to shut a few of these pages down and we're going to get into this and then i'm gonna um read um the proclivities of james white part two so i'll read that later on so but i just thought i'd show you all those all these things that are happening um the texas receptus page and so yeah so part four is happened it has already happened so that's that's interesting so I'll, I'll go through all them tomorrow uh in my spare time and um yeah if there's anything um w worth looking at i'll go through those videos and maybe um i can um offer a little bit of commentary on them but if these guys are you know to have a commentary on a debate commentary it's like <laughs> you can get a bit lost so anyway i'll shut that down and let's let james white continue so i'm pretty sure I, I just checked on my last video and i did mention the one hour and 30 minute mark and so i think it was one hour and 31 minutes so we might be going over a couple of things and it's been you know quite a few days since i've done a video on this so um it might be a little bit um repetitive but let's just continue Gave us this. okay so i've got to turn the volume up Actually, it's this one here. This was not at the Council of Nicaea when the deity of Christ was defined and defended. <laughs> Straight away, it's like. Um, so what about the early church writings um, that have TR readings in them? Like, like dozens and dozens. Um, like quote, many quotations in the, in the Gospels, many quotations of Paul. Um, that are uniquely Texas Receptus readings have been quoted by the early church writers, and see, you know, he'll he'll hold that up and and emphatically state these things. But at the end of the day, um, you know, J 
just because we have the manuscript evidence today um, and there might be said, like with 1 John 5, 7, we might, there's only, you know, 12 manuscripts of 1 John chapter 5 before the 10th century. And so there might have been, you know, 20,000 gospel, you know, um, uh, first Johns that were ever done. And to just assume that what we have today is all that was ever around, and that's a, an accurate representation. We're only just looking at that. Of course, you've got to look to other versions. You look at the Latin. It's in 95% of the Latin. Then you look at the early church writers, and you can see Athanasius quoting it. You can see Origen quoting it, Cyprian quoting it. And so there's many, many church writers quoting it. But see, these guys, they, um, every step of the way, these guys fight every step of the way. Um, if you say, okay, Cyprian was obviously alluding to this. He says, of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, it's written, and these three are one. Um, it's very clear. That's like in 250. But, you know, James White's like, oh, no one ever had, the, you know, the Texas Receptus at the Council of Nicaea. Um, you know, it's quite amazing. You know, he would make a statement like that. But, but then they just believed that in the year 400, everyone all of a sudden just had the Byzantine text out of nowhere. And, and no one made a big fuss about it. It was, it was just like, oh, we've all of a sudden, everyone's got the Byzantine text. Um, it just sort of came out of thin air, I guess, and just landed in everyone's lap. You know, how do you do that? Um, and even James White in his um, commentary on the Bible when he's trying to convince Muslims and trying to convince you know, other uh, Mormons and, and other people, skeptics, that the Bible is reliable. He's like, well, no one had control of it. It just spread out everywhere. But when he's talking about that, he's talking about the Byzantine text because the Alexandrian type text that he follows basically was Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Um, they were just in one location, in one area. And what, what about everywhere else, you know? And so he's like, it wasn't at the Council of Nicaea. I beg to differ. I believe it was at the Council of Nicaea. I believe that the unique Texas Receptus readings were all available at the Council of Nicaea. So James White just emphatically makes claims, uh, and many times you, you're like, okay, back that claim up, and he just goes with extant evidence that we have today, as if what we've got today is you know, all we've ever had, or what we've got today is, is a mountain compared to what they had back then. And what they had back then was huge. All they had was manuscripts. Um, He'll even sort of state that, you know, Erasmus only saw like, you know, 12 manuscripts, maybe 20 and all this sort of stuff. They're just pulling these numbers out of the air. I mean, how would you build a library back then? <laughs> like when the, when the age of printing was just dawning, how can you have a whole library when no books have been printed yet? <laughs> you know, what? it just doesn't make any sense. Obviously, there's manuscripts. And so they would have had lots of biblical manuscripts latin in greek they would have had lots of german they would have had lots of french they would have had lots of even languages that have died out and and anglo-saxon and things like that in in england and, and um these were in manuscript format and so um you know james white he's anachronistic in a lot of his um emphatic claims you know oh they never had this you know and then when you nail him down and say okay what do you mean by this oh well Every single word in, in you know, with with a, you know the covers on it, every single word that's in the text of receptors in one place. It's like, well, did you have every single word of your Bible then? You know, it's sort of um, they just he just makes these claims that he even his side couldn't even do either, and so it's just silly that, that these arguments are just ridiculous. Gregory Misa. Misa. Gregory, Gregory Nazianzus, they didn't quote, quote from this. Well, actually, Gregory Nazianzus um, said that there was a grammatical error in 1 John 5, 7 uh, and 8 um, where the comma is, which agrees with um, Eugenius Vulgaris, which agrees with Georgios Babiniotis, who recently said Vulgaris was correct. And so <laughs> it's... Sure, you know, some people were reading Bibles that were corrupted. As Jerome said, he said that, that there was corruption happening. But at the end of the day, um, just because some people read a corrupt Bible in some places, 
there are other places where they clearly have TR readings. Um, that that doesn't mean that um, we, we just put up with that or we, we can recognize corruption. Um, see, they didn't have James White's text either. That's the thing. He's just making this emphatic claim. And it's like, um, and this is just, we're talking about, you know, two or three people. And then we're talking about, we, you know, do we have everything that these guys had? Um, we've got to, we've got to examine every step of the way with these guys because you know james white has been known to make claims that are unfounded he said you know theodore beza you know he just invented um the reading of his somenos at revelation 16:5, and so i wrote a whole book basically saying no look it's in the ethiopic and now everyone's like you appeal to the ethiopic as your evidence i'm like not really i was just sort of showing to james white that it, it was around before Beza, just showing how dumb james white's claims are and so okay here it is in the latin um the ninth century in the eighth century here it is in a whole bunch of other statements and quotations and, and so i just went through and just showed people that okay this reading isn't just made up in the mind of Beza. and um yeah so james white makes these claims but Obviously, he um, when you when you come against these claims, he he doesn't want to look like an idiot, so he doesn't come out and just put a parallel thing like put his book there and put my claims next to it. No, he, he'll just pretend that this hasn't happened, or he'll try and demonize me in a certain way, and and then just sort of wave his hand and then just talk about politics for a couple of years. <laughs> it's like, okay, you're going to deal with these issues. You you've been saying people are you know, off the wall and people are like Mormons and we're like Muslims and we're all King James only. Yes, we're just like Peter Ruckman and all the rest of it and slandering people all over the place. And then we're like, okay, here's our response. And you don't even care. <laughs> it's like, okay. But this is the poor state of apologetics in America. Um, these type of wolves in sheep's clothing, they're going around just basically getting people to doubt their Bible. If you doubt your Bible enough, you will be accepted into the into uh, I said by them. Uh, you'll be accepted into the James White um, your group. You'll be part of his, you know, the cool kids who who have a Bible with corruptions in it. Um, if you don't doubt your Bible, you'll be a King James only cultist. So you don't want that. So you've got to doubt your Bible enough to be in his group. But if you doubt it a little bit too much, then you're like Bart Ehrman. So you just gotta you just gotta be like James White then you're not a cultist. <laughs> so it's like, it, and you won't come to his position just by yourself. You have to follow these gurus. Even if you follow Dan Wallace, you won't come to James White's position. It's unique. He believes, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, should be thrown straight in the bin. Where Dan Wallace is like, no, no I believe it's scripture. So these two, they're, they're friends. That they, they would, You'd think they'd be on the same page, but they look, whole verse, gone. That, that's how confusing this is and how can you have a, a religion but they don't even know what what the text says one one guy's throwing it out the other guy's keeping it in but then they're like oh it's all fine we're all friends it's all about having a good pastor and a good church and you know no, it's having the word of god that's unchanged what, what does the bible say about itself it's unchanging it's the words of almighty god but anyway i digress when, when they, they were, were dealing, dealing with, with the Christological, Christological issues in the, 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 the all through the fourth and fifth century, that this isn't nobody had this in their hand. <laughs> what about the 461 bishops that quote the Comma Johannian? Um, so this is in about the year 480, and they were debating against the Arians exactly what James White's saying no one did. <laughs> they were debating against the Arians, and they used 1 John 5 7. I mean, you don't get a more TR verse than that. And they quoted the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And they used that against the Arians. 461 elders were there in agreement with what was being said. And so um, James White's just, just making stuff up. <laughs> I mean, um, he is just being a wolf. He's being a slanderer. He is being a liar. And um, all in one, <laughs> he's, he's the full package of um, deception. I can document 
different reading after different reading after different reading all through this. Different reading after different, all through this. Well, what does that mean? What, from what these earlier guys were saying? I mean, these guys don't even acknowledge that had, anyone quoted the comma. Or they don't even acknowledge that Cyprian, they just say, oh, Cyprian was just making a commentary on, on another verse, you know. And it's like, how, how would you come up with that? The father, the the spirit, the water, and the blood. And, yeah, we're talking about the Trinity. Just because there's three things there doesn't mean it's a Trinity. Um, what, why would Cyprian even think that? And he said it's written of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. It's very clear. Um, but, no, James White, he's... Got his barrier to push. And yet, and if, if we're, we're being, being told, told this, this is, is what, what the autographs, autographs read, read. where's Where the historical, historical evidence? evidence? Who? In the There's stacks of historical evidence. It's just that James White rejects it. When we show James White, okay, well, this is what this person says. He'll do a whole dividing line program, have, firstly, you'll have Stephen Anderson there jumping on a pulpit. Then you'll have, you know, Peter Ruckman, um, you know, quotations or Sam Gipp or Gail Rippling here and talk about acrostic algebra, blah, 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 for like an hour. And then he'll say, oh, and there's this guy on the internet who says this and blah, blah, blah. And then he's like, well, I've already dealt with that. And so there's nothing to see here. And so, you know, you realize that King James only is a cultist. Um, and he doesn't deal with the, the issues. He doesn't deal with the facts. And I've just found he's just not really interested in learning. I mean, when you find new information, what do you do with it? <laughs> when when I'm confronted with new information, I, I want to learn and I want to grow. And I'll okay, okay well, how do I deal with this? And when I showed James White my book, New Information, he said he'd never read it. <laughs> like, ridiculous, you know. But that's James White. In the first, in the first century. century. Who, Who in the, the second, second century? Who, Who in the third, third century? century? <laughs> um, plenty. Pretty much everyone, except for Marcionites and a few cultists here and there. The reality, the reality is you, you can, can look, look at, at what, what anybody, anybody gave us in their sermons and their citations, and they will differ from this over and over and over again. Okay, so he's making this claim. Now, I'm just going to look something up. Now, this is actually an old website, so I have to go to Wayback Machine, um, which if you don't know about Wayback Machine, I'm going to show you because I don't want anything to be hidden, you know, like I've got some secret you know, little place that I go to. You can, anyone can type in Wayback Machine. Now, if you go to um, <clears throat> lamblion.net, which just conveniently happens to be in my search history there. Um, so Lamb Lion, now that page has been redundant for quite a long time, but about 2011, it was pretty hot. There's some really good stuff on there. I recommend any anyone who's involved with... Um, the Texas Receptus issue, King James issue, um, they should really go to Lamb Lion, read all Scott Jones articles. Oh, he has some very good stuff. And so if we go to, I'm pretty sure it's Bible Tools. Patristic Comparison Chart. Okay. <clears throat> now this will blow your mind. Because James White's basically saying, you know, oh, none of these verses appear anywhere. Okay, so God was manifest in the flesh. L look how many citations, patristic citations. And this, is, this isn't this is even exhaustive. This is just, you know, a guy going, okay, well, I found it here, I found it here. You know, God was manifest in the flesh. You know, 264, Chrysostom, God was manifest in the flesh. Again, Chrysostom. Um, Gregory Nyssa, um, God was manifest. In the, I mean, it's just all the way through. And so, um, you know, Matthew 5.22, without a cause. Okay, Irenaeus says, everyone who was angry at his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. He lived from 115 to 202. Um, the Diatessaron, without a cause. Cyprian. Um, without cause, uh, third century in Chrysostom, Augustine. There's so much. So this this guy's just only done it on maybe fifteen verses, where he's just put, you know, a few quotations: the Didache, 
Reputation, Chrysostom, um, but they're quoting the Texas Receptus. So when James White's adamantly holding it up and saying, yeah, they, they didn't use this, what he's actually saying is they didn't have it all in one place, you know, um, between two covers sort of thing. <laughs> Or they didn't exclusively only use this. They sometimes quoted other things. And it's like, well, yeah, sometimes people paraphrase. Sometimes people emphasize things and drop other things out. And when they're quoting things, you know, anyone who does work on the early church writers un understands this. And you have to put certain things into categories where it's like, okay, that's a direct biblical quotation. They're just copying the Bible there. Or this is like they're copying half a verse, but they've added, you know, something from the Old Testament in, into there. So, they're, you know, it's not just a full flowing verse or this is a paraphrase or this is a commentary or this is an illusion. You know, James White doesn't <laughs> he, he doesn't have these type of categories because he's just like, no, the TR didn't even exist. Well, you know, last 12 verses of Mark, look at all this. Papias in 100. He's like, who drank deadly poison, experienced nothing injurious, tation, the signs of which shall attend those who be, um, believe are these, they shall cast out devils in my name, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, if they drink any deadly poison, it shall not injure them. So, and it's how these are translated at times. So it might just be drink any deadly thing, but, you know, someone's tra uh, translated that as poison. Um. But yeah, you go through the early church writings, there's so much that is there that you, how can James White say what he's saying? Um, Ephesians 3, 9, how can he say what he's saying without just lying through his teeth? He's just lying. He's just emphatically, you know, hitting the table. You know, this is not the word of God, you know, but... You, you don't have to look far and you find TR readings all through the early church. Now, before, before we get into anything else, else here, I, I want, want you to understand, understand something. something. This, this is, is vitally, vitally important. important. The, the importance of our conversation is whether we as Reformed people will be able, able to defend, defend the text of the New Testament, Testament in a meaningful fashion or whether we're simply going to run back to the time of the Reformation and take this, ignore its history, ignore its background, and just say, this, this is, is it, and, and we're, we're not, not going to answer questions about it. That Who's saying that? <laughs> I mean, I, I will debate anyone anywhere on the planet about anything. If anyone asks me a question about the TR, I'll do the best that I can do to answer their question to their satisfaction. And I don't know any TR person who's just saying, this is it, this is it. We're not even, we can't even you know answer anything about it or we can't even question it let's just look at what exactly what he said here um, over and over and over again now before we get into anything else here I want you to understand something this is vitally important the importance of our conversation is whether we as Reformed people will be able to defend the text of the New Testament in a meaningful fashion or whether we're simply going to run back to the time of the Reformation and take this, ignore its history, ignore its back. Ignore its history. Who's ignoring its history? We're ignoring the made-up history. The anecdotes that Erasmus was just a bumbling fool who just didn't know what he was doing, um, was slipping all over the place, um, you know, just was throwing it, you know, errors into the text. It didn't know, you know, where, you know, whether they were genuine or not, and didn't care about the text. You know, all this sort of rubbish that James White says. We're we're just looking back at that, going, actually, that's not historically accurate. Sorry, James, but we we would probably take Erasmus's words over yours, and we can read his annotations. We can go through these things ourselves, and we just find that what you're saying. Even critical text guys are saying, hey, don't say, you know, the, these rush to print uh, anecdotes anymore. They're stupid. But James White just constantly, he just constantly has to parrot these things. Um, you know, he has, he has his own spin on everything. And then when you disagree with it, he says you're just disagreeing with history. No, we're disagreeing with you, James White, you, and your view of history. Um, most 
King James TR people are studying these issues you know, over and over and, and thoroughly going through with a fine tooth comb looking at these things. You're the one who hasn't changed his opinion on anything for the last, you know, 15, 20 years. You're just regurgitating the same stuff. That means you're not learning. You're not growing. You're not get, get, getting any, anything new. There, there's certain things I used to say about the Bible that were wrong. And anyone learning has to be humble and admit, yes, I was wrong five years ago. I used to say this, but now I'm saying that, you know. And James White's not like that. He's just he's just defending what he's already written because he was correct back then and he's correct now. And if you come against him, you're coming against God and you're coming against history and you're coming against truth. And you know, it's like, are you learning, James? Are you have you got a humble spirit? You know, can you learn something from someone who's not a critical text guy? You know, if I show you something, can you learn? Um background, background and, and just, just say, say this, this is, is it, it and we're not going to answer questions about it yeah, we're not but this is it and we're not going to answer questions about it i mean how ridiculous is that i don't know anyone who's saying that who is saying just this is it and we're not going to now in this particular debate van cleek is basically saying when i don't want to deal with the evidence here we, we're talking about a, a certain type of philosophy that you believe and Basically, James White's um, saying that he's a presuppositionalist, but he's basically only going to evidence for his bibliology here. So Van Cleek's just pointing that out and saying, okay, I'm not even going to go to the evidence. I just want to point out that you're not going by what the Bible says about itself. And so James White's like, oh, he's ignoring history. He's ignoring this. I mean, you know, Jeff Riddle isn't ignoring history. He's, he's not ignoring you know, issues about variance or, you know, last 12 verses of Mark missing or whatever. Often the t oftentimes he's focusing on these issues and, and making people know, you know, the, the full extent to how bad these guys are corrupting our Bible. <clears throat> he's not just like, no questions, no, you know, and all this sort of stuff. Now, in this debate, it's different. But, you know, James White's making out that everyone's like that. It's ridiculous. That's, That's what, it's, what about. it's about. It's, it's not, not about, about what Christianity, Christianity teaches, because, because I'm going to tell you something. something. If, if you, you take these two books and you apply the same method of exegesis and hermeneutics. Now, when James White starts talking like this, you know there's extra deception happening. <laughs> it's a bit like when all the political parties get together and they have a unanimous vote, you know, <laughs> something really bad's happening. You know, we're going to bomb some country into oblivion. But it's, you know, James White often will make these type of slow statements, you know, and he's basically saying, okay, if you've got the TO and you've got this, it doesn't affect Christianity. But then it's like, how do you define what Christianity is? So if, if, if I deleted the entire book of, say, you know, First and Second Chronicles, maybe the book of Leviticus, could you still have all Christianity? You know, you probably could. You could probably delete the whole entire Old Testament and still have Christianity. Um, it's it doesn't mean it's it's not a meaningful target. It's not a meaningful um, thing to say. But things are changed. Um, <clears throat> okay, so it says there's a bit of an echo when James White speaks. Okay, I'll see what I can do with that. Um, I'll just remove that and I will go to present. Um, Add to stream. Actually, I will completely remove that. So, share screen. So, 
hopefully this is a little bit better. Let's see. To, to these, these two, two books, books you, you will, will not, not come, come up, up with, with a, a different, different doctrinal system. system. The, the major, major differences, differences longer long ending mark, the woman, woman taking taken adultery, in. those are the two 12 verse differences, have almost no theological impact whatsoever. None. None. First, First John 5 7, 7 could not pop. I mean, that's amazing. The, yeah, the last 12 verses of Mark, the Pricope adultery, and then 1 John 5 7 have no real impact on theology whatsoever. To James White, you're like, okay, um, what about the theology in you know, the last 12 verses of Mark? He's like, what, snake handling and drinking poison? <laughs> it's like, um, that's that's the only thing. Oh, that's great. Thanks, Wayne. So I'll just put those up on the screen just so people know. Um, Wayne's just said there was a bit of an echo, and then he said it's gone. Um what I actually did when James White was talking, I muted myself because it might be coming back through my microphone here. Um, so, yeah, I, I just find that amazing that he says that because there's so much doctrine in the last 12 verses of Mark, but like it talks about these signs will follow those who believe. Now, this this applies whether you're a cessationist or not. This, this would have applied to the early church if you are a cessationist. Um, in my name, they will cast out demons. They'll speak in your tongues. Um, they will um, you know, drink any deadly thing. It shall not hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. And what was the other one? They will um, take up serpents. And clearly these things are spiritual things. You know, when it talks in the book of Luke, it says, uh, you will handle serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy it's the devil. I mean, the devil is called the serpent in the book in the book of Genesis, or even in the book of Revelation. I nearly said, um, all the way through the Bible, he's called the serpent, <laughs> and it's like all of a sudden it means a literal snake because some guys in Alabama do that. Like, where are you getting this from, James White? You're drinking it deadly poison. It says if you drink anything, you can drink any deadly thing, and it will not hurt you. I mean, Jesus clearly had a cup at Gethsemane and he said, you know, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, I'll drink it. He says to, said to his disciples, well, I, I can't choose who sits on the right or left, but um, uh, are you willing to drink this cup? And they said, yes. He said, you will drink this cup, but it's not my, my choice to put you on the right or the left or whatever. And so these things have biblical and spiritual signification. Of, you know, it's talking about martyrdom drinking any deadly thing you won't be hurt it says not one hair in your head will perish you know um you know someone burning at the stake obviously their hair burns and melts all over their scalp but um in spiritually they not one hair on their head has perished they, they've gotten a resurrected body and so um you know, james white is just making this up the pricopay adultery a lot of people misread the Pricope Adultera and say, oh, Jesus just broke the law and forgave her. No, he said, get some stones and kill her. If, if this is the case, he, he who is without sin, you cast the first stone. So he's saying, throw, throw rocks at her. And then they all left. And he's there by himself. And he, according to the law, you can't just have one witness. Um, so he couldn't even do it. And he was like, well, just go and see no more. And he's like, well, where are your accusers? He's saying he's not an accuser. He didn't see it, you know. And then, um, it, you know, so people, they they can read into that, um, you know, certain theology that's not there. But if you just read it um, as it is, it's clearly talking about um, significant things. Uh, James White just waves his hand says, no, they're not important. I mean, I could take out any Bible story, probably. I mean, is there any Bible story that I couldn't take out and just say, how that's not important? I mean, you think of anything. Just um, even if I took out the whole crucifixion narrative um, in the book of Mark, just took it all out. Well, it's in Matthew, it's in Luke. That's fine. Um, if I took out, you know, the woman with the issue of blood, you know, I could take that out. So, you know, James White just has very, very low standards. We don't want any words missing. He's like, I want what John wrote. I want what Paul wrote. 
Um, no, more so you're heading towards what Marcion wrote, James. Possibly, Possibly be original. original. If, if it, it is, is then the, the entire, entire Greek, Greek manuscript, manuscript tradition can be corrupted and important, important readings, readings fall out and, and have, have to be restored, restored from the Latin. Latin. So that... <laughs> important reading so um but with the last 12 verses of mark why why does he apply different standards last 12 verses of mark he goes to vaticanus and sinaiticus okay now there's 1637 manuscripts that have the last 12 verses of mark 99.9 percent .9 of everything has it there's only two that don't you know and so there is another one with a commentary and so but that's a little bit weird but um, mostly people just count that there's two. Um, but when it comes to the comma, we, we have manuscript evidence there, but we have 95% of the Latin backing it up. We have a huge um, grammatical solecism there, which is a, a huge error in their text if you don't have the comma in it. Um, you have a lot of quotations from the early church writers. And he's basically saying if, if that's been lost just in the Greek, because it's in the Latin, you know, people are quoting it all over the world for, for many, many, many years. It's in all the English Bibles, going right back to Wycliffe here. He's basically saying if the, the words of God were lost in the Greek, but then he won't apply that same standard to the last 12 verses of Mark. Well, the true reading... Um, has been usurped by this false reading, apparently. And James White said in his debate with Jeff Riddle that these are apocryphal. Sorry, he said they're Gnostic readings. It was Peter Gurry who said they're apocryphal. So he said they're Gnostic readings. And then when um, pressed, when Jeff Riddle said, okay, so it, would you, if they found manuscripts that you couldn't deny were uh, old and ancient and they had these readings in it, would you accept them? He said, yes. So he would accept what he's labeling as apocryphal, uh, sorry, um, Gnostic, into the text, or into his canon of readings. You know, it's it's so bizarre. Um, James White just has no solid standard. You could find a, a manuscript tomorrow and, and th throw it in James White's lap and he'll go, well, we have to delete this and, and change this. And he's all over the place. And there's not one verse in the New Testament that he wouldn't change if they found evidence enough to change it that, that would satisfy him or satisfy the guys in Munster or Tinder House or wherever he's going. That, that one's a whole different, different issue. issue. But, but the, the reality, reality is, is these both teach the Trinity, Trinity the deity of Christ, Christ, the, the resurrection. resurrection. I mean, you can find those in the Jehovah's Witness Bible. You can find them in the Good News Bible. It doesn't... I mean, you can even find some of these things in the Quran. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, I know people who have won over many Muslims, and they actually, when they go street preaching, they carry a Quran with them because they can prove that Muhammad was sinless. They can prove that Muhammad was saying you should follow the people of the book, which is um, talking about the New Testament. Um, there's many quotations in the Quran itself that point to Christians. And it says, you know, that Jesus was sinless, but then there's other verses that say only Allah is sinless. So it sort of proves that Jesus was God. And so it's quite interesting when you go through those. Um, obviously, there's, you know, contradictions and things like that in, in those in that material as well. But you know, he's like, oh, you can prove the deity of Christ. You can prove this. You can prove that. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> but we're talking about the words. Did Jesus, Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall by no means pass away. At the end of the book of Revelation, it says, don't add to or take away from these words or else your, your part will be taken from the book of life. How can you know? This is a pretty big sin. Like it's almost like, you know, taking the mark of the beast or something like that. If you alter the words of God, how can you know you're altering the word of God or not? If you don't know where the words are, how do you know you're committing that sin? If you're like, oh, I don't think that should be in Revelation or, you know, because a lot of people like say James White, they'll, they'll regulate that. So oh, it's only talking about the book of Revelation. I believe it's talking about the whole entire Bible. Um, but even if it is just, you know, let's let's play their game. It's only the book of Revelation. How do you know you're adding or subtracting from that if you don't know where the words of God are? If you've got <laughs> the words of God all in a, in a line and it's like, okay, well, yeah, we can't take that word out. He hasn't got that. He's got 
you know, the majority text over here, and we've got the critical text over here, tuned our house over here, and we've got the text of receptors, which we'll never go to ever. And when he debates, like, say, Revelation chapter 15, verse 3, he just basically debates to show that the TR is an impossible reading. That's usually what he does. And so he'll point out three different readings in Revelation 15, uh, 3, but he doesn't tell you which one he goes with. And so it could be, it could be anyone. Isn't that exactly what the book of Revelation is saying? Don't add to or subtract from the words. He doesn't know which one to go to. Um, if you read his articles on it, if you read what he says about it, but then he will, if, if he was here now, he'd probably just out of embarrassment, go, oh, no, I'll go with the Nestle alarm. When we pointed out there was conjectural emendation in the Nestle alarm, he, he was like, oh, I'll go with Tinder House now. <laughs> he just changed the goalpost. But now he says Nestle alarm and the apparatus. I mean, have you seen how big these apparatuses are in the Nestle alarm? There, it's like a, you know, a smorgasbord of words at the bottom, so you can sort of chop and change anything. So that you know, choose your own adventure. Really, where's his standard? If it's talking about adding and subtracting words, it, does he know if he's committing that sin or not? Because I know, I know when it's what the book of Revelation says. I know where to find the words of God. He doesn't. Blood, Blood atonement, atonement, everything, everything are, in are in both of these. Of these. And, and if, if you, you apply, apply the same, same standards. standards. Okay, so um, I just got here. I'm still hearing an echo from James White. Either there's an audio issue or he's quoting the Amplified Bible. I think it's because I'm not muting myself. So what I'll... I'll do is I'll mute myself and then play him. But usually, because sometimes he'll say, you know, one thing or in 10 seconds, I can stop it five times, <laughs> you know, and then let it go on for two minutes. But um, sometimes he'll just say, you know, five errors all in a row. And so it's hard to mute and unmute, but I'll tr keep trying to do that. It's a bit of a shame that that's actually happening. Maybe I can turn the volume down on my computer and maybe that won't affect it too much. You're going to have the same teaching. So, so why, why are we here? Because I don't care if you use the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, yes, he does. <laughs> if you read the King James on the controversy, if you are uh, just the grandma who reads the King James, you are a King James onlyist. If you're a majority text person, he mentions Zane Hodges, you are a King James onlyist. If you think that the King James has good textual basis, you're a King James onlyist. If you think the TR is good, you're a King James onlyist. If you're a Ruckmanite, you're a King James. So he has these five different categories. And all the way through, he's saying you're a cultist, you're a King James onlyist. Because he, he, these guys know that KJVO has this baggage. And so it's like saying you're racist, you know, if you um, don't want to eat Chinese food, you're racist. You know, it's like all the way through, <laughs> you, if you have anything to do with the King James, it's like you're a racist. Um, you're a racist. <laughs> you're a um, King James journalist. <laughs> Bit of a uh, Freudian slip there. But the, the issue, issue is when... when... Can you guys tell me, I've actually turned the volume down on my computer. Is that echo still there? We engage in responding to someone like Bart Ehrman, who is corrupting the faith of many. Are we going to utilize the entire spectrum of the gifts God has given to us? In and so all of a sudden it's like, oh, Bart Ehrman. See, this is the thing. James White talks about all these other religions, talks about Bart Ehrman. Why doesn't he just deal with the issue of the TR and just talk about that? No, he has to go into all these other places and sort of win the battle over there. And then it's like, okay, now we'll deal with the TR a little bit. And then it, it's, he's talking about Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman and him would be in agreement that the Nestle Alarm text is probably about as close as they're going to get to the text. And so it's just ridiculous that he's, you know, bringing up Bart Ehrman and like, oh, we, you know, God's given us all these gifts. What about, um, you know, God's, um, yeah, given gifts, 
<clears throat> okay. So I will pause it next time. Um, God's given gifts, but um, perhaps some of these readings are from Marcion. How do you know they're not? How do you know that it's not, you know, readings or manuscripts are, are from heretics? Because you can't know if the thing's as big as, a, you know, a credit card. How, how do you know who wrote it? And why, we, why do we have to change our Bible today according to just that? Oh, it's the oldest and all this. Well, you know, 616 is old. Is, is that viable? Are we going to change the mark of the beast now? Um, so anyway, I'm going to pause. In the papyri, in the early unseals, or are we going to throw all of that out and say it's completely irrelevant? Because think about it. If we had the autographic original in, say, no later than 1644, why, have we bo why are we bothering to do any textual criticism today? Well, I would just say, <laughs> yes, exactly. Why are you bothering doing textual criticism today? Um, at the end of the day, um, it's we've already worked out where the Word of God is. And the thing is, he's acting as if the papyri has just totally changed their Bible. It hasn't. Um, text critics who work in the field say the papyri, um, yes, while it might um, cause people to favour some Vaticanus or Sinaiticus readings, but there's no real standalone like, oh, it's in the papyri, let's just run with that. Um, most people have said that the papyrus hasn't really affected the text at all. So James White has, you know, makes much ado about the papyrus. Um, and Jeff Riddle, he talks about that quite a bit and says, you know, a lot of people say the papyrus is just over-exaggerated. Um, it's over-emphasized. What can it lead to? What can it lead to? I mean, it's led to us being able to identify all sorts of places in here where the reading that this contains is not what anyone in the early church was reading. It's not what anyone in the early church was reading. So all those quotations, um, you know, that I, I showed the patristic chart, God was manifest in the flesh. And see, what's amazing is when I'm talking to critical text people, I'll show them 1 Timothy 3.16 and I'll go through this, God was manifest in the flesh, and they'll argue against me, you know, really full on. And then I show them what James, Wright, James White James Wright, wrote in his book, that he actually defends God was manifest in the flesh, the TR reading. He believes what Dean John William Burgon said about this verse is true. And so it's quite amazing that people will just, they'll just jump in and start wrestling about this verse. And then when I say, actually, your guru is in agreement with me, it's like they lose their mind and um, they just stop fighting. Because how can you come against that? You know, they, James White spoken. <laughs> and these people have set themselves up as the new prophets, the new gurus. There's not much difference between him and a Benny Hinn or, a, um, you know, that's probably why he likes Michael Brown so much because these people set themselves up as authorities over the Word of God. And over you know, if you've recognized the Word of God somewhere, they want to rebuke you and tell you that you're wrong. And so they want to be God. They they want to be the voice of God. They want to be the authority. And this whole issue is about authority. Where is the authority? Is it in the Word of God or is it in these gurus who tell you, no, you can't read that verse. No, that verse needs to be thrown out. And sometimes for no good reason either. It's just in, you know, Vaticanus or, or Sinaiticus doesn't have it or whatever. Everything else does. And they're just like, no, well, some prophet back then spoke, you know, the, the Watchtower magazine says it, or the, you know, the Pearl of Great Price says this in Mormonism, you know, it's that they just go with, um, you know, the, the consensus of the academy because, you know, that is the new um, prophets, the, the prophets in New York for the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons or, you know, you know this is the new papacy. And oftentimes it actually is the papacy. <laughs> um, 
the United Bible Society text is um, if you do a version from that, you uh, you have to join with the United Bible Societies and you get permission from the Vatican. How's that? <laughs> and so it's quite amazing that James White will never talk about this type of stuff, um, the collusion with the Roman Catholic Church and um, modern-day text critics. Anyway, let's continue. Everybody who read Revelation 16.5 in the early church read about he who is, who was, and is the Holy One. The Holy One. Hasios. No one had ever read Esomenos, the plural form. That's what's in here, because Theodore Bezos felt it fit better. Sorry, I'm just having to mute myself, and it's this tiny little button. So I'm switching him off and then trying to find this mute thing. Um, or unmute myself. So he said, basically, you know, Theodore Beza just sort of made it up. Uh, so that's why I wrote my book on Revelation 16.5. I proved that 30 years before Beza, the Ethiopic text has um, a, a somenos there, um, you know, equivalent to shall be in the King James it's basically the reading of Beza, but it's before Beza. So obviously this is before Beza. Betis of Libana, uh, Haimo Halberstadensis. These two guys, they had um, commentaries in the 9th and uh, 8th century. And one of them was a commentary of a document that was written in 380. Um, so people have linked it back to then. That this commentary has um, the words um, shall be in it. So when you go through, the, there's Latin evidence, there's Ethiopic evidence, um, but also the fact James White hasn't even come up to the to the level where you know we've been at for years and years now, where we know that um, the annotations weren't really adequately translated properly. And so Jeff Riddle and Larry Brigden from the Trinitarian Bible Society, both experts in Latin, they went through and they personally both, um, you know, translated these uh, annotations at Revelation 16.5. And it clearly says that Erasmus has uh, or had in his possession an ancient manuscript with the reading of Somnus in it. And so he put that in there because of that. Now, in my book, I prove that it is a form of nomina sacra there because it's the past, present, and future of Jehovah. And so it's probably the most holy name of God in the whole entire Bible. So um, this was news to me when I started to write the book. I was very fascinated in this. I wasn't really a Tetragrammaton fan, but all of a sudden I'm reading through reams and reams of information about the Tetragrammaton, and I really didn't know that it meant the one which was and is and shall be. That's what they used to say in the temple. And so uh, it's um, clearly a nomina sacra. I just did a debate on this uh, two days ago. If you um, go to that, you can um, learn about that. But um, James White is just making up rubbish. He's just saying, oh, Theodore Beza thought it sounded better. So he went with it. And he's not acknowledging... Um, nomina sacra, he's not acknowledging the name of Jehovah there, he's not acknowledging that Theodore Beza said he had an ancient manuscript that he went with there none of that, he's not acknowledging that many people before Theodore Beza said that it, you know, read this way um, so why let the these pesky facts that we're bringing up get in the way of his good story that basically, you know, he can just wave his hand and say Revelation 16.5 uh, King James, bad, you know, <laughs> TR, bad. Theodore Beza is making things up. You know, he's been saying that for years, but we've given him new information and he um, hasn't processed that. He said he'd, he refused to read my book, so maybe he actually didn't. I, I assume that he did because there was some stuff that he said, which I thought, well, maybe he has read my book. But then again, um, you know, James White was pointing me to read Young Kranz's beyond what he's written, which I had already read. And I reread it because James White told me to. And then it was like two years later, he announced that he'd read it. <laughs> he finally read it. So he actually hadn't read it when he was telling me to read it. 
so it's <laughs> it's quite bizarre and that's what's in here aren't we still connected to the church that read revelation chapter 16 for 1500 years before the reformation isn't that reading what the church had embraced? Most definitely it is. And so that's what the issue is. It's not about naturalism or anything like that at all. It is what was originally written by the apostles and how do you determine it? Has he given us the historical documents to do that? Or do we pray about it? Okay, so notice this type of slander. You, you pray about it. Um, you're making out because um, Peter Van Cleek has announced and said that he's not going to use evidence, that he just wants to talk about whether James White gets his bibliology from the Bible or whether he gets it from archaeology. Or, you know, and the whole thing is um, Peter Van Cleek's basically pointing out, you know, James White believes in young earth creationism because the Bible says it. Not because you know they found bones or they found an upside down tree somewhere or, or you know geological records or anything like that, but because the Bible says it, and so that's what Van Cleek's saying. Well, do you have a good bibliology based upon what the Bible says, or do you just go by the science, you know, sort of thing? And that's why he's not dealing with the evidence because it's like that falls into where James White's at. And I can understand that, you know, I'm, I, I do um, look at evidence and all the rest of it, and, and I'm pretty strong on that. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, I, I can understand where Peter Van Cleek's uh, coming from. That really is the issue this evening. Thank you for your attention. And with that, we are going to take a break. It's good to know you could get saved with either version of the Bible. I was getting a little worried there. <laughs> God is good. For what's been a great debate so far, we're going to take a how long break? It's going to be a 15-minute break. <laughs> of copies of copies and on and on hundreds of we'll keep the time and so uh, i'll n let you know at five minutes or one minute one minute will be great all right let's get started all right dr wait thanks for uh allowing me to ask so that's the problem when i'm muting myself sometimes i leave it on mute it's really hard to uh juggle all this <clears throat> but i'm gonna not mute myself I've just turned it down on YouTube a little bit. Maybe that was the problem. It was might have been distorted or um, so. Anyway, let's just continue. Ask you this quite these questions um, you, you find online. It's difficult to to really have the undivided attention of someone. So I really appreciate this, and I consider Dr. White to hold his position as he does, and uh, as it appears, um, really generally speaking. So um, this will be good. We'll see what happens. Uh, in Kurt Eichenwald's The Bible So Misunderstood It's Sin, he writes, quote, No television preacher has ever read the Bible, neither has any evangelical politician, neither has it the Pope, neither have I, neither have you. At best, we've all read a bad translation, a translation of translations of translations of hard copies, copies of copies of copies of copies, of copies, of copies and on and on hundreds of times. With that as a backdrop, is the NA28 equal to the autographs? I have, I have no idea, idea what Kurt Eichenwald and his manifest ignorance has to do with the question, but I'll answer the, the question. Uh, as you know, we believe that the NA28 uh, represents the earliest text of the New Testament and that every reading that was in the original autographs is found either in the text itself or in the footnotes at the bottom of the page. So notice he's saying it's in the text or in the footnotes. And there's so many footnotes. The, the, even James White's like, oh, there's these exhaustive foot, footnotes. There's, it's got everything that, you know, it hasn't got everything, but it's like, I mean, it's got a lot of alternative readings, um, you know, 
things that are in margins, things that have been quoted by early church writers. And, and so you can just pick and choose through them, according to James White. And so this is one of the things with the New King James is what they had was, um, or they said that what you can do, is, if you read through the New King James, it's based on the TR, you know, it does depart from the TR, but it's primarily based upon the Textus Receptus. But with the uh, majority text note, at notes and the um, Nestle Aland United Bible Society notes or the NU notes, you can just go along and if you see a reading that you don't like, you can delete it. If you see something you want to add, you can add it. And so you can sort of make up your own Bible as you go. And so that's what James White's sort of saying here. You can go through and read the Greek and you can, if you don't like the reading in the text, you can go down the bottom and you can, you've got a smorgasbord of uh, tasty little variants that you can choose and make your own Bible up as you go. <laughs> it's, it's quite amazing. This, this, See, he never used to say it in this fashion, but since we pointed out that there there is conjectural emendation in um, uh, Second Peter chapter three verse ten, uh, he's pulled right back on this, and he went to Tindow House, but now he's like, no, Nestle Alan, I'm sticking with that, but I'm just saying it's in the apparatus. So when you point out a problem in the main text, he's like, well, I don't go with that. I go with the other reading in the apparatus. <laughs> so. Um, he makes up his own words of God as he goes. Now, does this sound like normal Christianity to you? You just can sort of make up what God wants to say on the fly. <laughs> you know, can you just read through and say, oh, look, I like that reading. Yeah, um, I'm sure there's probably a lot of TR readings in the apparatus as well. Does it, can you go with them? Can you go with their text and then read a TR reading and squeeze that in? Or, I mean, he does it with um, 1 Timothy 3, 16 um, against, you know, most other people. So he's TR there, but then when it comes to 1 John 5, 7, he's not TR. So if I if I had his position and I just said, no, I believe the comma is genuine, I mean, would he accept me into his group or would he say I'm just a weirdo or, you know? It's it's so strange. Uh, I do believe in the doctrine, not doctrine, but the concept of tenacity, as explained by Kurt Olland uh, in his work many years ago, and that is that all the readings in the New Testament persist in the manuscript tradition, including the original readings. I believe that is uh, a vitally important aspect of why we do the work that we do. But at the end of the day, it's like, well, they're found there in the manuscripts. Now, I understand, you know, that that there is truth behind that. But um, you've got to be more specific than that. It's like saying, you know, all the words of the English language are found in the Scrabble set. Or you could, if you have a widgie board, you can make those words up. Or if you have alphabet soup and in the morning and you can see in at night what what came out the other the other end and it's it's you've got to be more specific you've got to say where the words of god are found where james white's just making it purposely vague it's just well it's here in a roundabout way but we, we can't be certain about these things and so they have to pride themselves in being uncertain and just say well we don't know and and be happy with that but then he'll turn around and say, I want what John wrote. I want what Luke wrote. I want every word of God. I don't want just what a scribe thought. I don't want what Theodore Beza made up in his own mind and all this stuff. And it's like, well, you can't have one, you know, how come you can't figure out what John wrote? How come you can't figure out what Luke wrote, Mark wrote? How come you have to have this apparatus you, can't you figure it out and, and just not have the apparatus? <laughs> um, that's why the Tiata doesn't have an apparatus. <laughs> they've, they've nailed it. Okay, uh, just so we're clear, uh, I purposely phrased these questions as I did because I recognize that the Q&A time can be a time that will, can really absorb the other person's time. So I purposely phrased them as yes or no's. If, if you think that it's not a fair question, you can say it's not a fair question. If you don't understand it, you can say that. But... As best as, as possible, possible, I purposely, purposely 
uh, uh, sorted these questions, questions out as yes, yes or no. no. If you want to object to it, you think it's a bad question, I'm fine with that. But um, this, this could turn, turn into like a long talk and really I'm trying to get through my questions. questions. So, so in the, the end, end, after you concluded, would you conclude, would you conclude that, that the NA28 does indeed equal the autograph? Well, again, I just uh, answered, answered the question. question. Uh, I, I said, said that, that the autographic readings are found uh, in the text or in the footnotes uh, provided to the text because, because that, that represents the entire the manuscript tradition where the autographs are found. How about the But notice oh, that represents the entirety of the manuscript tradition. But where is the reading of what Theodore Beza had there in the text? Are they going to put that in? I mean, Jan Kranz has admitted that Theodore Beza um, did say that he had an ancient manuscript. And I think we've proved that um, over and over again. You know, James White doesn't want to admit it. But Jan Kranz, who he says is a go-to guru of his, he's admitted it. He says it's in the Ethiopic, which is evidence. Um and so uh, at the end of the day, the apparatus doesn't have this information in it. And um, amazingly, uh, James White's claiming that it has all the information when it doesn't. And this is just one small issue that, you know, I've decided to go, okay, Revelation 16.5, that's my thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to study everything on it. I'm going to look at absolutely everything. And so that's why I know these things, you know, on, on other verses, you can, you know, name another verse. I'm like, oh, I'm not really sure I'll have to study that, you know. And, but on this, I know my stuff. And I know that James White is wrong. I know the apparatus is wrong. And so where else are they wrong? If just some guy like me can figure it out. Um, imagine, you know, if you had a team of scholars who were going through this information um, you know, just looking for errors in their text. Uh, you know, we find fault all the time with their text. And so he's just, just like, oh, no, it's, it's got all the readings there. No. Um, even in 1 Timothy 3.16, there's six false citations. They claim that Codex Alexandrinus um, has basically the, the reading of os there which means who, you know, who appeared in a body. But it's clearly theos, which is God was manifest in the flesh. And even James White should be going with that, you know what I mean? But if you look at um, the apparatus, the apparatus, it says who. Now, why does it say who? Because today the line that is above the nomina sacra and the line in the theta has faded. So it does look like os. But if you look back at the custodians and the provenance of that manuscript, it's had like six owners since um, it was given to uh, King James. And all of them have said that it read Theos in nomina sacra form. But now today, because those lines have faded away, oh, no, it says something different. <laughs> it, it goes with the critical text. And it's like, that's a false citation. You're going against all the known history of that manuscript. Uh, yeah, it's quite amazing. These guys, um, you know, I, I don't think James White realizes how corrupt his um, apparatus really is. Body of the text. I'm sorry? sorry. Is the body of the NA28 equal to the autographs? No. Okay. Is the Gospel of John and the NA28 in the body of the text equal to the autographs? I think I just answered that. So, no? Yes. Or yes. Or yes. <laughs> you can see James White is so disturbed with these questions. He's just like, because he's admitting these things, people are going to be making memes for the next five years about this. They're going to be cutting out this little bit. Muslims are going to be, you know, getting snippets of this. Um, you know, he's just admitting that the NA28 text isn't the word of God pretty clear it's it's a it's little frustrating, frustrating because, because um once, once again, again just so, so everyone, everyone can understand, understand. When, I'm when i'm talking about, about you, have you have the body of the text, text and then you have, have the textual notes, notes at the bottom so, so when, when you, you have, have a variation, variation in, in one manuscript, manuscript or other manuscripts manuscript, the readings are provided, are provided to you on the page, page. Now, now this is not an exhaustive text uh the ecm would probably be the better thing to ask about because it's significantly closer to being exhaustive 
uh, in the readings that it provides. Okay, so basically he's he's nuancing this and saying, well, um, I go with the Nestle Alarm text most of the time with the apparatus, but with, like I said, the ECM, I would go with that as well. And so he's just he's just covering absolutely every base. So the, the, the 400,000 variants that Bart Ehrman talks about, he's saying, okay, I'll go with my reading and the 400,000 variants as well. You know, I have that just, just in case I'm wrong again. I, you know, I get proven wrong again and embarrassed. I can always just dig down through them and find some other reading that that's um, you know, more applicable. And so, and so what we're talking, talking about, about is, is I'm, I'm saying the autographic, the autographic readings, readings exist in the, in the manuscript, manuscript tradition that's been preserved by God, God providentially over time. That's, that's what, what I'm, I'm saying. saying. That's, that's I think it's pretty, pretty straightforward, straightforward assertion. Right. right. So, so And so these guys believe that the manuscripts are preserved and the message is preserved, but not the words, okay? Because if, they, if the words were preserved, they could easily just go through the ECM. They could easily go through the Nestle line and pick out which words are, are it and go, that's it. But then they're out of a job. <laughs> and so they, they want this perpetual thing. It's like, you know, if you've ever heard of the military industrial complex and, you know, they have, have to have perpetual war because someone's got to, you know, make the shoes for all the soldiers. If you've got 100,000 soldiers, that's a lot of shoes. And you can make money off that, and you've got to have the socks, and maybe they've got five pairs of shoes, different types. They've got to have you know, trousers. They've got to have shirts. They've got to have T-shirts. They've got to have un underwear. They've got to have guns. They've got to have missiles. They've got to have hand grenades. They've got to... There's a lot of money to be made with standing armies. And so if you have um, all these variants causing all these problems and confusion and everyone's thinking like Bart Ehrman, um, there's there's a lot of people who will um, benefit from this when the new Bible comes out on new evidence and Dead Sea Scroll Bible and the you know the new fiend dangled Bible based upon the papyri Bible and all this stuff they will um, they'll sell and there's a billion dollar industry here so it's it's not just you know some backyard operation this is huge. This has to do with people like Rupert Murdoch, you know, who owns the rights to the NIV and the New King James. Um, has to do with Zondervan, massive um, group, you know, owned by um, News Corporation. And, um, you know, Tinder House, a whole bunch of other guys. And Crossway, Logos Bible Software, they, these are huge players in this. And they can't make money if you just buy King James, you know, every 15 years because your, yours is worn out. Um, you know, they're, they're, how are they going to make money? They want you to buy 30 different new translations. They want you to take them to church. They don't want you to just have them on your phone. Or if you do have them on your phone, you've got to pay for it. And you've got to you know, pay a monthly thing. and Or you've got to get Logos to get the real word of God and, you know, go to the Greek and Hebrew and, and get all the scholarship and, you know, ten thousand dollars you can get everything and you know that's why these guys they these guys are salesmen for the bible industrial complex and so they have no interest in just the word of god being put out there and put out there for free when i told james white that when i was in pakistan i was working on an urdu bible translation he went oh what a waste of time as if that's what they need <laughs> we're like a hundred years earlier the Bible Society would have still been printing TR Bibles and the people who, like Henry Martin and others who um, did those Bibles are, are seen today as heroes, like, like Tyndale and all that. Uh, change it 100 years later. Ugh, what a waste of time. What an idiot. <laughs> it's, it's just amazing how things have changed. And that's why we're looking at this going, things have changed, Mr. White. We haven't, you have, and you and your new, um, you know, text criticism who's turning the whole planet into a bunch of Bart Ehrmans, um, you, you're destroying um, the foundations of Christianity. Well, I don't believe they can be destroyed, but um, in a lot of people's minds, you're destroying faith, you're destroying confidence, and um, you're going to answer, answer for this on the Day of Judgment. First John, First John chapter, chapter 4. four. 
uh, is that equal to the New Testament autograph? I think according to the NA28, there's 37 registered variants in that chapter. Again, is the, is the body of chapter four equal to the autograph? Okay, I'll, I'll keep repeating myself because we're asking the exact same question. Uh, the exact same question is, you have the body of First John chapter four, and then you have the references, and all the original readings are contained in one of those two sources. Um, I, I'll keep answering. Well, the thing is, if he kept going down and said, okay, so in um, John chapter 4, verse 6, do you believe that, you know, or what, whatever verse he chose, do you believe that they're the words, or, or do you believe this one particular word? Um, See, so James White's just making it all vague, like, you know, oh, it's in this one or that one, you know, it could be either one. Um, what? How can you have certainty on any Bible verse when it's like that? The same, the same way, way if we need to do it, it but it would be better, better if we got, got to something, something more substantive. Because James White knows that he's getting schooled and he's getting exposed here. And um, this is what he feared. So is there any verse in the Gospel of John in the body of this text that's equal to the autograph? Oh, certainly. There are plenty, plenty of verses that don't, don't contain variation. So notice what he said there. If the verse doesn't contain variation, then it's equivalent to... The originals you know which verses don't contain variation i mean there's i mean you might find you know some places where it's like you know say uh we were just going proofreading through uh, matthew chapter 7 last night in the Urdu bible and there wasn't really any variation there there was you know, one or two places where we that we looked at but most of it's um very similar to the uh, critical text, but some other um, chapters, you're looking at you know, 20 issues, 30 issues, and that's just in the Greek, let alone how things are translated and brought across. And so um, it's all over the place in, in some places. Well, just because they don't contain variation, do you equate that to being autographic? Uh, given, given that there's, there's no, no evidence, evidence of any transmission uh, break in the transmission of the text, uh, yes. Is any okay? So based on the evidence, um, if there was evidence found about anything in any verse in the Bible, if there was sufficient old evidence, papyri evidence from the second century. Is there, there any, any verse, verse that, that you would, would not change, change if we could find evidence, evidence for that change? Uh, the, 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 theory, the theoretical question being asked is, could we find um, a, a, a papyrus uh, that contains, say, one chapter from the Gospel of John that would have new readings in it? It's extremely unlikely that that would happen um, because of the fact that uh, we already have those very, very early papyrus manuscripts. So what's amazing here is... This is exactly what happened with you know, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Like, you know, basically the TR was the only thing around. <laughs> and then, you know, they had Vaticanus, but that was rejected, rejected over and over and over. But then all of a sudden it was like, oh, the renewed interest in Vaticanus. What's at the bottom of the barrel? Let's tip the barrel upside down and start looking at that. This is the best one now. But then when they found Sinaiticus, so this is, you know, the 1840s, um what happened was uh then they're like oh this verse needs to be changed this other verse needs to be changed there's a whole bunch of new variants and then when you find the papyri there's a whole bunch of new variants again and so he's saying oh it's, it's very unlikely that this will happen well it's happened in the past you had a stable bible in the past but then isn't it new findings that have changed the bible so then he's saying all well, new findings in the future probably won't change anything. It just it just seems like he's um, waving his hand around here and not really answering the question. And they, we, we know uh, what, uh, what, the, what the Gospel of John looked like all the way up to possibly as early as 100 AD. Uh, so would, would, we, would we love? We know what it looked like up to 100 AD, but you can't tell us? It's in the Nestle Alarm and in the apparatus. It's in, you know, the English language is in the dictionary and in the Scrabble puzzle. Love to have. 
such new discoveries, it would be, it would be wonderful. Would those in any way disrupt the message of the Gospel of John? There's really no... Would they disrupt the message? So, you know, it's not the question. Notice he's deflecting there. It's, uh, would it just disrupt the message now? Instead, would it disrupt the words? Would it cause problems with the word? I mean, you can, I could probably add a hundred words to the Gospel of John and it wouldn't change the message. You know what I mean? I could probably delete four chapters out of the Gospel of John. It wouldn't change the message. It's, you know, the general gospel message, you know. And half the time they're like, oh, there's no doctrines changed. But then it's like, oh, there's no cardinal doctrine, which is how many cardinal doctrines are there? You know, you could probably write that down on an A4 sheet of paper. So he's saying you can basically delete everything except for just a few cardinal doctrines. So the resurrection's there. Jesus died on the cross. You were saved by faith. You know, just have these in a list. And that's enough for your Bible to be validated. No reason to think that that could happen. So again, if we could find a second century manuscript that changed the Gospel of John in some way that you don't think it should be changed now, would you be willing to change it? Um, ask and answer. I, I just answered that question. Okay, so I suppose the reality, yes. the reality is that uh, there is an assumption, a hidden assumption being made uh, that you could have a second century manuscript that has no, no copies, copies that, that have, have that had nothing, nothing to do with the transmission of the text over time. And we, we have not yet encountered anything like that. that. Uh, and, and so, so it is a, it's, it's a theoretical question that's uh, a fantasy. It doesn't have anything really meaningful to do with actually doing textual criticism. Yeah, it's not a, a, a hypothetical question. It's a real question that speaks to how you would treat the Bible. So again, again it, it seems, seems to me, to me correct, correct me if I'm wrong, wrong Right? Right. Tell, Tell me if I'm wrong. wrong. That if that we if found, we found evidence, evidence to change, change a passage, passage of scripture for any verse in the New Testament, Testament you would be willing, not to say that you would, but you would be willing to change any verse in the New Testament, Testament based on the evidence. evidence. Again, Is that you're right? Again, you're wrong because you don't. Uh, I'm, I'm, with all due respect, having read uh, your book about poking the bear, I don't see that you've ever done textual criticism and hence. So now you have to have done textual criticism, like as if a TR person is going to go, okay, well, I'm just going to engage in textual criticism and just start, you know, following the um, critical text. Or, I mean, most of the, most TR defenders, you know, we've read, you know, books by Pickering and, and Maurice Robinson's articles and James Snap's stuff. And um, we, we frequent, you know, the, the E, TC blog and uh, we're looking at the same material that everyone else is but we feel like we have the Bible so we're looking at these things from a different angle just to see what what the latest um, argument is going to be against us and usually it's you know probably 30% of all that is just sort of anti-TR so we, we see that behind the scenes it's like oh, okay here we go, Jan Kranz has just done a whole article on why we shouldn't have the TR. and So then we will respond to those sort of things with the other things that might be just general curiosities and things like that. Um, but, yeah, why would Van Cleek have, have to have done textual criticism to, to, to ask James White a simple question, you know, to say, would you change the bible like if we found you know second century manuscript tomorrow um would you change the bible according to what that manuscript says and obviously that's what text criticism is doing it just seems like james white doesn't want to answer this because he knows that jeff riddle put him in hot water when he answered this last time and it was basically um he proved that um james white would go um would change any verse anywhere if given enough information about it. So in other words, the whole Bible is unstable to him. You can just have an archaeological finding and he'll change his mind. And the amazing thing is, if I say something like archaic Mark, which was proven to be a forgery about 10 years ago when they found Prussian blue ink in it, they scientifically tested it, found out it was a fake, 
this was a favorite by the Alans. The Alans, they used to footnote this quite a lot in their works. A lot of people were um, drawn in by this. And I had Elijah Hickson say recently, oh, not everyone was sucked in. I'm like, yeah, but the Alans are pretty much up there with being gurus of the critical text. And so if you can deceive those people with a fake, um, what's to say that, that there isn't, you know, like some of these manuscripts, some of these papyri aren't fake and people are being sucked in to these readings by them. What if there was a huge fake that came on the scene? James White just believed it and threw out a whole bunch of Bible verses, but then it was proven like, okay, Mark to be a fake. I mean, you know, th this is, this is the problem. And this is the thing that Van Cleek is pointing out that James White doesn't have a stable Bible. He doesn't believe what the Bible says about itself. If he believed what the Bible says about itself, like I was saying, Revelation chapter 22, it says don't add to or take away from the words. He doesn't know which words you should add or take away from because he doesn't have a, uh, he doesn't have every word. So you are making up uh, fantastic, fantastic um, theoretical, theoretical ideas, ideas that, that don't, don't work in the, the real world. world. Because, because we are talking, talking about, about how a text has come down, down to us and it's come down through multiple lines. lines. So, so you're, you're talking about one line, I'm talking about multiple lines. lines. Unless you can refute that it has come through multiple lines, lines, the rest of it really doesn't make any sense. So all of a sudden, um, Van Cleek's got to um, prove that it doesn't come from multiple lines. What's he talking about? Like be a Byzantine, Caesarean, Western... Alexandrian, what, what's, what's he talking about? Multiple lines. This is ridiculous. And when you look at the manuscripts that he's pointing to, you know, he's saying, oh, there's a direct correlation between Vaticanus and P75. Now, in my previous videos, we looked at that, and I proved that Taylor de Soto clearly said and proved that the cutoff point for a manuscript being um, related was like 98%. And when you look at when you look at um, Vaticanus and P75, it was like 79.5% or something. It, it wasn't much. It was right at the very bottom. And these guys are making out, it's just almost like a direct translation. Or, you know, James White will make out there was this other invisible manuscript somewhere that they both you know, got information from. But, yeah, they're different, you know, by like you know, 30% <laughs> sort of thing. Um, or well, that would be, you know, 20%, but they're different like by 20%, which almost disqualifies it from even being like the other one. But apparently that's really strong evidence, you know? Yeah. So I guess I'm just not going to get my questions answered tonight. So Dr. Riddle asked you this question before you gave a similar answer. And so I guess I'm pressing you on it again. This is an opportunity, someone who has a doctor's degree to answer the question, whether or not there's a single verse of the Bible that you would not be willing to change if, if there, there were evidence, evidence to change it. Absolutely. This is a simple question that could be answered by someone with master's degrees, 170 some mediated debates. Like, I think that this could be something you could answer. So is that a yes or a no? Out of respect to the audience, ask and answer. I've already answered the question. You are assuming things that are not evidence. Provide things that are in evidence, we can have a meaningful conversation. Okay. <laughs> Just refuse to answer. I mean, can you imagine if we were, like, if, we did a debate with James White and we refused to answer these type of questions. He would just say, well, why are we having a debate then? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, obviously, James White, if he was shown, you know, an old manuscript that went back to the second century, it was proven, everyone went, this is absolutely it. And it had, uh, uh, you know, readings in there that were, you know, shown to be these new fangdangle readings that apparently were, original he would run with it just like they did with with um Sinaiticus. and like the papyri he's saying that they've done it in the past but he's saying they're not going to do it in the future what's changed he's saying the cbgm is going to come up with all these new readings and so i guess they're sort of saying well the the amount of variance has stopped coming in you can't get any more variants well every time you find a new manuscript you're going to find other variants how many of your Christian beliefs are primarily based on posterior historical evidence? Um, 
very few uh, at all, if any, but of course there is a vast difference between my Christian beliefs and the readings of manuscripts, which are historical realities. <laughs> so that's like saying, okay, um, you know, do you follow evolution uh, or do you reject the, the teaching of evolution? Do you follow young earth creationism because of what the Bible says? And, and him saying, no, I follow the science. But, and this is the sort of thing that Peter Van Cleek was fishing for. He's trying to prove that James White is basing everything on evidence and not upon, um, and when, when I say evidence, good, bad or ugly evidence. He's not basing it upon the Bible. So my, so my belief, belief in the Genesis flood is, is not, not parallel, parallel, and it is a major, major category, category error to make it parallel uh, to uh, the, the readings, readings of, uh, say, uh, the, the manuscripts that Erasmus possessed. Um, so, okay, I can accept. So, yeah, he's saying it's a category error, um, you know, to look at, what are, and see, the thing is, you have, it's not James White is equating what he knows about Erasmus to be the be all end all historical end of everything. And if you reject what he says about Erasmus, you're rejecting history. It's just ridiculous. James White is not humble on this. He doesn't know that much about Erasmus. He was saying that Erasmus copied you know, the Aline brothers it's like i've never heard of the aline brothers i don't think anyone has he obviously meant the aldus text which is aldus minutius who's like you know, legendary printer it's like saying the gutenberg press was the the glutenschurg brothers it's it's just it's so bad it's a really bad error that he made there and it just shows you the the level of respect he has for these type of people, for Erasmus, for the Aldean press, for you know, the Complutensian guys. He has no respect for these guys because to him, the King James issues, we're like Mormons, um, we're like Jehovah's Witnesses. Erasmus is a dumb idiot. Um, but amazingly, Erasmus would not be a dumb idiot if he was brought into the future and, and given the information that James White has, all of a sudden he would make rational thoughts <laughs> um, because he would love to have what we have today, apparently, you know, but he's a dimwit back then and a liar and, and, and scamming and didn't believe this and that. But if you bring him in the future, he would, he would be like James White, you know, <laughs> it's quite amazing. Um, uh, Following truth says, hello, Nick. Uh, Wayne trains, says uh james white could have answered a lot of these questions with a simple yes but he didn't because he knew it would have made his position look bad yeah absolutely it, it just seems so strange that james white you know leading apologist in america um especially for bibliology most people look to james white for which bible they read and he kind of uh, answer simple questions it, it shows you that he he's not being honest here. He's not being open. I mean, surely he could have uh, answered in a yes or no fashion and then given his take on it, but he didn't. He was just saying, I refuse to answer it. No, answered already. No, I'm not talking anymore. And just refusing to go there, where um, obviously Peter Van Cleek has, uh, you know, a, a, a point that... Um, is a bit of a bee in um, James White's bonnet. He's he's having a bit of a stir about this. So following truth, LJ says, having a chat with Stephen Avery later today on 1 John 5, 7 in the grammar on my YouTube channel. So I saw that earlier and I did promote that at the beginning of this. Um, so that'd be cool. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to be like one o'clock in the morning, uh, my time. So I'll have to um, you know, listen to that tomorrow. But, yeah, that looks really cool. And, um, yeah, uh, hopefully, um, yeah, uh, Stephen Avery, one thing I'll, I'll, I'll say to you um, is get Stephen to get a good pair of headphones and 
and a mic or something because oftentimes it when he jumps onto this channel um i appreciate his input and i appreciate his boldness to just come on but he will be talking into a phone like this and it's filming just his ear and all this stuff and and people are just in the chat saying can't understand him can't hear him um and that and you just see the numbers go from you know 15 people watching to like four people watching and it's it's really frustrating and i'm like it just you know do you know um grab some headphones you know and so it has to be done and so um i know when josh gibbs and uh stephen avery and james snap had a debate um it was uh, he he was really good in that and it was quite well done and so he he needs to because the thing is people see how things are delivered as well i mean you know if i'm here and i'm sort of fiddling around like this and you know it's like okay well you know <laughs> you know people just tune out you know and so uh, that's the one thing i'd say it's going to be good but you've got to be pretty hard on that because I have said it like probably about 10 times to Stephen and he's still, and that's one of the reasons why I actually don't do too much live stuff because, um, I, you know, oftentimes Stephen will jump on, but then it's like you know, an hour of conversation, but it's probably, probably about 15, 20 minutes of man, you got to, you've got to get a head, headphones. You've got to, I can't hear you. No, you're mumbling. No, it's there's no audio anymore, and it's it's really quite frustrating. So, um, fallen truth said shame. Yeah. So I, I wish I could watch that live, but um, would have been good to have you put in your own input. And I think Stephen will be able to do um, anything I can do. He's pretty switched on with all that, um, and he he probably he knows quite a lot more than what i know so um yeah press him with all the hard questions um yeah that's really good i'm glad you're doing that it's really good and so i've noticed that you interviewed also peter van cleek or it was on your program or something like that was that right following truth um and so anyway peter van cleek and his father had or was no that that's their own channel i think Anyway, they've done like four videos talking about this debate, which is pretty cool. So, um, oh, great. That's great. Yeah. Um, Elias, he's got some really good information about the comma and being a native Greek speaker. Um, when you talk to native Greeks, um, they clearly um, can see the, the grammatical issues very clear where and the Anglo Sanhedrin, I call them, the, the English speaking Greek experts. Yeah, apparently they know all about Greek. It's it's just as funny, you know, like if someone rang you from India and said, I want to teach your children English, and they didn't really know the language that well, you, you would be like, Well, you don't really know it that well. And that's like how we must sound, you know, the Anglo Sanhedrin, the, the American twang on the Erasmian pronunciation and all this, and people like James White and Dan Wallace. And, and you know, they they must just laugh at, um, you know, Bible scholars who think that they know these languages. And it's like my friend, you know, up in where I grew up in Melbourne, it's got a huge Greek population. Uh, but here um, where I live, there's actually a huge uh, Israeli population. So most of these guys speak Hebrew fluently and they can read the Old Testament just like we, we would read, you know, the King James sort of thing. And, um, you know, that they sort of laugh, you know, people trying, you know, and all the rest of it. But, um, yeah, it must be frustrating for them to hear from people who aren't fluent what they're language means it's like someone telling us no the english language you know we had a guy in the after debate chat in um uh cj cox uh in the after debate after will kinney debated someone recently and there was a guy there from um he, he was portuguese and he was just saying oh no this is an error in the bible and 
even the critical text guys were going, no, it's not an error. And I'm like, no, it's not an error. And he's like, uh, so how how much have you guys studied into this? And it's like, well, well we haven't because it's not an error. <laughs> and he's like, see, I, I win. And it was just so frustrating. It was like, man, you don't even know English, but you, you, you're trying to say there's problems with the English language and it's so frustrating. And this is like how... Greek-speaking experts like Georgios Babiniotis, you know, 200 books on the Greek language, six dictionaries. They call it the Babiniotis Dictionary. It's like the Webster's Dictionary. You know, oh, let's grab the Babiniotis off the shelf, you know. Um, you know, this guy, he said the comma should be in there, the comma Johannium. He said that to me personally. I, I was like, wow, that's amazing. This guy's a legend um, linguist. And he said the comma should be in there. And so these Greek guys can see it like this. We're non-native Greek people that they can't see it. They're just, they're just stuck in text-critical thinking. So, yeah, that should be really interesting. I'm probably only going to go for a little bit longer, maybe about 15 minutes longer. Um, I just want to just push this along because I know that if I don't push this along, I'm, this is just going to hang around. I want to get onto other videos as well, but I really did enjoy this debate, so that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this. So let's continue. And I just want to ask a question. Is the audio still echoing? Um, it would be good to get a bit of feedback on that when I'm playing the video. That if the evidence is overwhelming in favour of some X, whatever particular that may be, do you believe it is best concluded that X is true? Some, some X, X which is like a placeholder. X, X is a placeholder, so, you know, you know it could be like where you want to go to eat or it could be a manuscript. manuscript. It, it could, could be a reading. reading. Some, some belief, belief right? right? So, so if, if the, the evidence, evidence is overwhelming, 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 overwhelming in favor of some, some X, X, whatever you want to put in there, do you believe it is best to conclude that X is true? We would have to define whether we're talking about historical statements, scientific statements, Mathematical, mathematical statements. statements. I, mean, I mean, there are all sorts of different, different ways. ways. What, how, how, what kind of evidence do we have? I mean, we're, we're told, told that there's overwhelming evidence of the evolutionary theory. theory. I, don't I don't believe it. it. So, um, I, 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 it, I don't know how to answer, answer the question, question because it's not specific enough. Well, that's, well, that's helpful. helpful. Um, so, so would you agree, agree that, that a mountain, mountain of evidence is not necessarily determinative of truth? If the mountain of evidence is actual evidence in relationship to the subject being Address, address, of course, course it, it is. is. But, but when, when it comes to evolutionary, evolutionary theory, theory uh, it's, it's, it's the, the fundamental foundations of how you analyze evidence that's, that's up, up for grabs. Would you consider evidence, evidence to be part of arguments? Of course. <clears throat> 64 days ago on the dividing line, you quoted at minute 36, Put your hand on the Bible and swearing by a higher authority than you. The collection of man's arguments can't be piled up to equal an authority higher than God. Do you concur with that? Of course. So if a collection of man's arguments, which are include evidence, cannot conclude or reach the authority of God, then why is it that you do this with manuscript evidence? A category error. We're talking about historical reality of determining what the original readings are. We are not talking about the ultimate authority of God to define law, truth, meaning of history, everything else. Um, we are talking about how you determine what the readings that showed up in this are and why they were not the readings that people before this had. Very simple difference. Can you define a category error for us, please? Of course. Um, we've heard a number of them this evening. It's where you make application uh, of an argument or facts and data that have application in one specific area and you move that over to another specific area. So uh, using Plantinga's reformed epistemology and warranted belief and applying it to historical documents, which he never did, uh, would be one example of a category error, confusing canon with the text so the, in other words, specific readings like in Jeremiah uh, is another example of a category error where you are moving the data out of where it has meaning into an area where it does not. So according to the Cambridge Dictionary of Philosophy, quote, it is thought that they, that is category mistakes, goes beyond simple error or ordinary mistakes. 
as when one attributes a property to a thing which that thing could have but does not have, since category mistakes involve attribution of properties of things uh, to things that those things cannot have. Right. So the idea of using a category error, if it cannot have, uh, Dr. White, have you uh, demonstrated that my categories cannot have these properties? Yes. Or have you simply just said there are category errors? No, uh, I, I have because uh, you have you have confused the canonicity of the Gospel of John with the specific readings of the text of the Gospel of John. We all recognize that we can see that the Gospel of John exists as a body of literature, but the specific readings of manuscripts down through time are not the same as the canonicity of the Gospel of John. And nobody prior to the modern period of printed texts and electronic texts and everything else could have ever even imagined of not recognizing the distinction between those two things because they all lived in a world where every manuscript they read was different than the same manuscript of the same book because they're all handwritten. Is the canon inspired? Is the canon inspired, not in the sense of scripture. The canon, uh, I, I agree with Dr. Kruger. Uh, he and I gave a good presentation, I think, on this at G3 a couple of years ago. The canon is an artifact of revelation. It's not the object of revelation. Because if it's the object of revelation, then it's the 28th book of the New Testament and uh, needs to be recognized as such. And now you end up dealing with Rome on the issue of who's the source of the canon. Okay, okay so, so again, again just, just for all, for all the, the audience. audience. So that's quite an interesting take. And this is one of the areas where I really need to come up to speed with. Um, <clears throat> And so, yeah, thanks, Wayne Trains. He said there was a slight echo, and then when I muted myself, that echo was gone. So that shows me where the problem is. It's in um, this audio coming through and, and getting picked up um, by where my voice is. And so, um, and so at the end of the day, um, yeah, I, I really need to come up to speed with a lot of text and canon material. Um, when Jeff Riddle and Robert Trulove did their conference, I, I really, I, it took me a while to get my head around what they were trying to say. Um, and I, I, I did try. I, I, I guess I really should get into Kruger's material because they were recommending that at the time. Um, and it's one of the areas where I really want to get more into. Um, I think there is an attack on the Canon but also specifically, you know, who wrote the the words of God, who wrote, you know, say Second Peter, for example. Oh, it's not Peter, it's some other guy. And, you know, Bardo men will attack these type of things. But having, you know, oh, this is a list of um, the books of the Bible, um, but then saying, okay, well, this is a, you know, like a different book. When you look at, like, the changes that have been done to, um, Mark, like the last 12 verses of Mark. I mean, more than half of the chapter gone. Uh, that's huge. That, that's a huge change. Uh, it's a huge distortion. And so when does it get to the point where you've deleted 12 verses and this becomes a canonical issue? Because some of the some of the books in the Bible, like, you know, Second John, Third John, they're very small. And it would contain about the same amount of words. And so if you were to sort of go, okay, well, I can't, you know, if we were to find old manuscripts with lists, so the Meritorian fragment, even though it's not actually 170, people, you know, it's almost like both sides are saying it's 170. I know it has reflection back to them, but we've got to be a little bit more careful with that because I think people are going to start pulling this up over um, that type of dating. But if we had, you know, lists and, you know, Second John wasn't on there or Third John, um, we just go, okay, well, they're not on there. Cross them off, off the list. Or imagine if there was a list and it's not on there and it's not in the Bible either. Or it just had the heading and no, or it had the space for it, like the last 12 verses of Mark, but nothing there. And we're like, wow, they never got around to doing it. And, and, we start deleting that from their Bibles. I mean, when that, that, that's the thing, when does it become a canonical issue 
Um, is it the canon just the list of names? Is it just what sort of appears between the covers? Um, so it's quite an interesting thing. And w why do we have that separate, you know, canon um, text thing? And so um, it's something I want to look into more and something I want to learn more about. And so I just sort of point that out. That, and that's why I'm sort of listening mostly to this and not commenting because I'm just like, okay, well, um, I know Peter Van Cleek's got his ideas on this uh, and he's written, you know, books that are sitting here in front of James White. Um, and, you know, really I should get into these books and um, learn a lot more about this issue. Would you be willing to say for all of them that the canon is not inspired in the context in which I just said? The canon is the artifact of inspiration, not the object of inspiration. If you want me to explain that, I did in my book, Scripture Alone, if you want to look it up. Uh, but it's a very, very important distinction. Okay. Are the words of Scripture inspired? Of course. How are they differently inspired than the canon is inspired? Because the canon is an artifact of revelation and not the subject of revelation. Yes, can you explain what an artifact of revelation is for all of us? Sure. Um, now I get to explain to you how the canon came about. That's great. Um, when, when God, God in, since, since God inspired some books and not all books, then the canon of Scripture comes into existence when He inspires. Okay, so God inspires some books and not all books. Okay, so you know He's talking about like you know, Gospel of John's inspired. You know, the Gospel of Thomas isn't, but. Um, Yeah, okay. The, the very, very first, first books, books, and when, when he finishes, finishes inspiring the last book, book you have a canon, canon that exists, and God, God has perfect, perfect knowledge of it. It, it is, is totally different than our coming to understand what the canon is over a process of time and history. If you do not recognize that distinction, you will have a very difficult time. So he said that the, the distinction distinction that we have to recognize and the reason why he's sort of you know being a bit um vitriolic towards um peter van cleek for not a, you know, asking appropriate questions is we have to recognize that god has his own canon so he has like a list of books and goes okay well those 27 books new testament they're in if we through you know christians throughout time have sort of you know toyed with the idea of having you know the gospel of thomas in there or something like that and yeah, we've had 28 books. Um, we've got to recognize the difference between that. But is that what Peter Van Cleek's really talking about? I don't think so. I think um, I think James White's just sort of making it a separate, completely separate argument and saying that's what Peter Van Cleek's saying. Um, and it just sounds scholarly and um, I, I, I don't really see that's what that's an answer to Peter Van Cleek's question dealing with Rome's claims to being the source through the church of what the canon actually is. So, but biblically speaking, God has preserved his words. So the canon is made up of individual words that, that are, are, are all compiled under headings. And so if you distort those words and change, when, how far can you go in distorting those to the point where it's like, okay, this is a modification of the Gospel of John, or this is a paraphrase, or, you know, we, we look at the Codex Beza, we can look under John or whatever, we can look under anything there, but sometimes it's distorted, sometimes it's totally changed. Um, when does it get to the point where it's like, okay, that's not a part of our canon? If you change one word or t two words or five words or a hundred words or... Um, you know, delete half the entire chapter, like in the last 12 verses of Mark, when does it become like an issue? Um, when when does it become something different? Or all those categories is sort of, you know, this is the whole thing. Who formulated you know, the lists and what, what makes the list sort of more important than the words? And so this is one of the things which I sort of like this because it's challenging a foundational thought process that we've we've got. You know, these these books you know the head, headings of these books and 
you know, but as long as you've got those books, you can sort of have, you know, change and chop, or chop away, you know, bits and pieces here and there. And it's still, you know, Mark, it's still, you know, John, even though we deleted these 12 verses. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's, I, I enjoy thinking outside of the box like that, but um, yeah, I really need to come up to speed more on that. Is it true that you're not a fan of Anthony Fauci's mask and social distancing mandates? Is it true that I'm driving a fifth wheel even today? Um, yes, it's obviously true. Did it bother you that the experts first said no mask, then flipped to yes, mask, or first no vaccine, then definitely vaccine, then in some places vaccine card to travel? Worst thing was, uh, that data already existed prior to uh, March of 2020 in regards to effectivity of masks and so on and so forth. So the experts were just getting their money. Are you an epidemiologist? Nope, but I did major in biology in college and was department fellow in anatomy and physiology, so I am not untrained in the area. If you're not an expert, then why do you, re why do you reject the experts? Oh my goodness. Uh, because many experts reject the experts. And the fact of the matter is, when you have the largest private transfer of wealth to, the, uh, to other people, including big pharma, uh, I recognize the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. Is it true that Bruce Metzger regarded the Byzantine text type to be corrupt and disfigured? I would imagine so. Don't remember that exact quote, but probably. Okay. Uh, it is in uh, Textual Guide to Greek New Testament, page 26. Is it true now that the CBGM scholarship regards Byzantine text type to contain very old texts? I'm sorry, what? Is it true now that the CBGM scholarship regards the Byzantine text type to contain very old texts? Uh, there are representatives of the Byzantine texts, uh, for example, a manuscript 33, that the CBGM analysis, and if you want me to explain CBGM analysis, I will, but... Um, the CBGM analysis has placed more weight upon them. So just notice there, um, <clears throat> yeah, James White, it's like no one else can know about the CBGM except for him. He's, he can explain it to Peter Van Cleek because, you know, he probably won't understand it properly. I can explain it to you, you know, sort of thing. Um, but Peter Van Cleek's just basically pointing out Okay, so Metzger said in Byzantine text is corrupted, but now they're saying, okay, there's ancient readings in the Byzantine text. So they're going with the Byzantine text all of a sudden. And so that's one of the things with Westcott and Hort. They were saying there was a Lucianic recension, um, that Lucian um, had uh, corrupted the Bibles and the Byzantine text was a corruption. And so they were bringing back the, the text back to um you know what it was before he corrupted all the bibles and this was disproven even the papyri had old ancient um uh, byzantine readings in it and so how could they attest for that if it was just this you know corruption that he that lucian had done and so when um when you go through you know bruce metzger and other people they, they were influenced by this type of uh thinking but now they've come full circle and they're like, oh, well, the Byzantine text is probably good in some places. And so it just shows you this methodology is, it's not concrete. Um, they're all over the place. And sometimes it's not even new new manuscript discoveries that are changing people's minds. It's just the, the philosophy behind the, the critical text um, methodology is just differing. It just becomes boring to some people. So they go, oh, well, Maybe, you know, let's go with, let's look at Codex Beza. Maybe that's the real text. Yeah, I can see that happening next. <laughs> um, I'm probably giving someone out there an idea. You know, someone's like, how can we make more money? You know, we want, you know, we've got Codex Vaticanus, we've got Sinaiticus, but mate, let's go with Codex Beza and say that's the original. And we'll say that, you know, there's readings that back it up. Some papyri out there surely backs it up in somewhere, someplace, and... That can be the new Bible. And they'll just have this whole third branch of you know, faith life Bibles. The, the para, if it was a paraphrase for the early church, it's good enough 
for, for them. It's good enough for Jesus and Paul. It's good enough for you today. Buy our Bible. You know, you can see it happening. And unfortunately, it's probably going to happen. <laughs> it, it, it's, I've just thought of it. This is the first time I've ever thought of it, but it probably will happen. That's how bad the Bible industrial complex is today. Like, think of the worst case scenario, and it's probably going to happen. 616 is probably going to be a reading in a modern version before too long. 616 in Revelation. Um, maybe we should bet on this. I'm not, I'm not a gambling man, but maybe we could, you know, bet. And, you know, if, if, if I'm right, um, in the next five years, if they come out with 616 in a, in a modern Bible version, you know, James White has to give me $100 or, you know, I wouldn't bet like that, though. Uh, however, however uh, if, if you, you look, look at, at the uh, pastoral, pastoral epistle, not pastoral, the, the general epistles and Acts and Mark, there have been a very small number of actual changes between the Nessialan text type and uh, the result of the running of the CBGM uh, analysis. I think it was 30 changes, almost none of which impacted the meaning of the text whatsoever uh, in the... So there's 30 changes because of the Byzantine text, but many of these scholars are saying the papyri hasn't really changed the text either. But James White is like, if you don't know about the papyri, if, you, if you're mentioning anything from before the age of the papyri, you don't, you know, what's the point in saying it sort of thing. But it didn't really change the text that much. And then he's saying, oh, the Byzantine text is only like 30 places or something where there's changes. Um, no, that's, that's uh, their changes. <laughs> and so why are you going with the Byzantine text that was formerly seen as just rubbish? general epistles how much time do i have two minutes and 28 seconds <laughs> right i'll leave it there okay That's the problem with a mute button. <laughs> it's very difficult. So I've got to try and work this echo thing out. Um, maybe I'll try and... Yeah, maybe I should wear headphones at, when I'm doing this. I think that's the go, and the audio will come through anyway. Um, anyway, so what I said then, which you didn't hear because I was muted was uh, Peter Van Cleek's leaving it there, so I'm going to leave it there too. I'm glad that he pulled the pin then. Um, and so I've got to go and have some dinner, and I've got to do a bunch of other stuff. But, um, yeah, thanks for watching, guys. Um, uh, follow in truth, LJ says, there are many atheists and attackers of the Bible that say 616 is original. Uh, they claim the Bible has been corrupted and hidden the true number of the beast. <laughs> so I'm sure there's a bunch of books that'll be made about that. I'm sure that Dan Wallace will probably try and make some money off that somehow. But the more variance for them, the, the, you know, the more demand churches will, will be, you know, uh, gripped with fear of, of these variants and they will be looking for gurus to show them the true light um, you know, just like people want a word of knowledge or something from Bill Johnson or Benny Hinn. Um, people want the true word of God from James White and Dan Wallace. And is it 616, guys? And they'll say, no, it's 666. You can trust your Bible, you know. And this will be the new thing. Um, it's quite predictable once you see um, this happening. They love Bardoman. Bardoman for them uh, means they're perpetually going to be mopping up um, the the issues of textual criticism. And oftentimes they agree with Bart, but 
you know, he goes overboard and so they have to mop it up and so they have to get invited to churches and so they have to you know be on the payroll somewhere and get funded and you know apologetics groups will constantly hold these guys up in high esteem because they came against Bart Ehrman. it's a it's almost like you know when you see those cartoons and you got the you have the two puppets fighting against each other but it's the same person you know it's um you know Bart Ehrman and James White debating or Dan Wallace it's like they're just they're not debating they're just having a conversation really they both believe mostly the same stuff they just come to different conclusions okay guys I'm gonna leave leave it there um and i'll continue on where i uh 207 16 so i'll just um i'll just get rid of that yeah so i can say 207 16 um and we'll continue on there again so thanks for the encouragement guys red headliner says god bless and uh wayne train says great stream nick Thanks for joining us. God bless you and we'll see you next time.